So we take a program as powerful as Houdini with procedural geometry. And then we combine that with the ability to simulate almost anything and provide state-of-the-art solvers for all these different types of objects. And what is the unifying factor there? What's the most effective way to harness in both of those things and get them to work together at their fullest? And it has to be the commanding use of transforms, specifically transforms at the geometry level. Uh, rigid buddies, we get a lot of really good workflows concerning transforms because each rigid body object has a transform associated with it. That might not be the case with fluids or cloth. But here we have a really controllable transform. So here I want to take a fairly difficult situation to simulate effectively and efficiently, like this really, really concave, deforming ground and box. And we take some things that would really not be very good rigid body objects. And we're just going to try to simulate these. So what's going on here? Well, this simulation, uh, it might look a certain way, but realistically, it is being simulated a very different way. This is what the actual simulation looks like. And we're getting the results we want because what's important in a rigid body simulation isn't how it looks, it's how it moves. It's the transform of these objects. So here we want to start just with something fairly difficult you might get in a production scenario, some type of highly concave deforming ground. And here I've just copied the gray thing. And this is going to be the nightmare to simulate efficiently because it's, first of all, not watertight. And it's fairly dense. And then there's a lot of curvature that is both deforming and that we're going to preserve. So their natural first instinct might be, OK, well, I'm going to extrude this thing and turn it into a collision volume. And then I'm just going to use a deforming collider. Well, that could work, but it's going to be incredibly slow. And it's not going to be very accurate because if something has to recompute each and every frame to form a collision, there's really no collision velocity on there. Even if we were to do a trail or something, it's just going to be a very poor representation of real collisions, real transforms. So there are some alternatives there if we really know how to work with transforms in SOPs and in DOPs. So I'm going to start off by computing the rest. That's the critical part of any transformational calculation. Okay, so I'm just going to lock this at the first frame by using a time shift with F start. And now let's get this quite a bit lower resolution. So I'm going to do a remesh. And it's important that we don't do this to animated geometry. So here, it's just bouncing all over the place. We get different topology in every frame. Uh, this we can't compute a transform off of. But because we're locking off the time, this we can compute a transform off of, no problem. And we're going to use each of these triangles as its own rigid object. OK, so now with the facet, I'm just going to separate out the points, unique points. And then let's assign a name attribute to each of these. So we can do the name assignment with the uh, digital asset I've been using. OK, let's call this uh, ground. And let's take advantage of Houdini's deformational tools. So I'm going to do a cloth capture into form. Cloth capture and a cloth deform. So this is about rigid bodies, not cloth. But the cloth uh, workflow can really benefit SOPs in a lot of different ways. And here, we just want to deform these triangles according to this moving mesh. So here, we take our different topology, and I'm going to capture it. So I'm going to capture uh, this rest geometry with this geometry. OK, so here, uh, it's going to be a time-independent capture. And by default, these radii are going to be pretty darn big. So let's just um, decrease the capture radius quite a bit here. OK, hopefully that's enough. All right, now we want to actually deform it. So this is going to have an animated component of uh, deforming cloth. So these two have to be the same topology, which they are. And here's our uh, capture. And we want our rest cloth, which is the same as the rest cloth we plugged into there. And now 
we get to forming triangles. Even though this process isn't perfect, because there is still stretching and bending, it should be good enough to extract some transforms off of this. So I'm going to do a uh, extract transform. Okay, so once again, we need reference geometry and the target geometry. So our reference geometry is the static geometry right here. And our target that we want to get to is going to be this guy. Okay, and we can go by the piece attribute name, which is what we assigned here. Okay, so now it's going to give us a different transform with an orient and a pivot uh, and a position each and every frame. So at this point, we can make whatever objects we want in place of these, and we could potentially use these transforms to just move them around. They will not be deforming because this isn't deforming. And out of points, there is no deformation either. It's just telling it where to go and how to rotate. So here, let's poly extrude. Get some depth on these things because these are going to serve as colliders. And maybe like that. And I want to output the back to make them watertight. OK, and then let's do a transform pieces just to test this out. It's not going to be used for anything, just to test it. All right, let's see if it works. OK, so there's definitely some distortion happening. They're not preserving uh, the distances because their size isn't changing. But this should be definitely good enough for some rigid bodies to interact with it. And it's going to be a lot more efficient than a deforming mesh. It might be more stable than a cloth simulation. A new DOPS network. I'm going to put this into the second input, so it's just going to be the resting collider geometry. And the extract transform points, well, I'll put that in the third input. And we actually want to use this process, the transform pieces, in DOPS directly so we can get all the nice velocities and, and animated colliders. So we can do an RBD fractured object. And let's point that to whatever is connected to the second input index. There we go. So you've got ground one, ground two. OK, now these are static right now. And to move them, we would do the point position dot. And we're going to point that to the third index. And we want to set the time to set always and dollar sign $t just so it inherits the current time and it updates on every frame. And there's one more thing we have to set up, and that's that each object needs its own transform. And each object should correspond to uh, the points in our transform point. So for point number, I'm going to use the ID of the object, the dollar sign obj. It's actually not the ID. It's the number of the object being processed. So if that is successful, now we're getting a one for one transform for each of these triangular pieces. And this should function as a very efficient, very accurate collider. OK, so now uh, we've just got some objects over here. Uh, nothing special about these. So I'm just going to plug that into the first input. Uh, let's do an RBD fractured object set to 0. OK, object 1, 2, and 3. And let's set up our standard simulation. So that involves gravity, a rigid body solver. Uh, we're going to merge this in the first input because it's static. It's not being uh, solved uh, with the second here. And there we go. So we're getting all these nice velocities. We're getting very efficient collisions. And no one ever has to see this. Okay, the only thing that matters is the end visual result. Okay, so now let's take this one step farther and let's use some post transforms. So in this stop, we don't really need this anymore because we can render that. Okay, so we can render this, uh, we don't need it. But what I'm interested in is I want to use this as my render geometry. I'm just looping through these and turning them into this weird shape here. 
All right, so I want to get the transforms out of this DOP network just for these three objects. Okay, it's going to be object one, two, and three. So I'm going to use a DOP import and just extract the transforms that we want. We don't really care about the geometry. Okay, so this DOP network, uh, we just want objects with the prefix of objs. Okay, so object is going to be objs star, and we want to create points to represent objects. So now out of that whole simulation, this is really the important information. These are transforms. Okay, so now we can use these transforms to move around this static rendered geometry. Okay, so we can use our transform pieces. Uh, these go into the first input and our transforms go into the second input. And they have to be in the same spot as uh, whatever you're using to simulate, but if they are, then, and they have the same name attribute, which is what it uses to tie these two things together, then we get our simulation looking however we want the surface to look. The rendering geometry can have a completely different look than the simulation geometry. And as long as we really know the ins and outs of how to work with the transforms, and there's a, a few great tools to do that, such as the extract transform and the transform pieces, as well as the DOP imports ability to create points with transforms present on them to represent objects. Uh, with what we've already learned about uh, the name attribute, and now what we know about transforms, we should really be able to take advantage of both worlds, great looking geometry, and also very fine-tuned collisions and interactions.